So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, like Nick, Nick said, uh, my name is Maroon, and today I'm going to be talking to you about React Native. Uh, before I jump into React Native, I just want to take a moment to talk about hybrid applications. Uh, I'm a Java JavaScript developer, so the last few years when it came to building mobile apps, I would actually build them as hybrid applications. And hybrid applications are uh, of kind where you essentially build out a web application with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then wrap it in a web view uh, using something like Ionic, Cordova, um, or PhoneGap. And then uh, that layer of Ionic, Cordova, or PhoneGap also provides you access to uh, native APIs so that you can talk to uh, the actual operating systems uh, like iOS and Android. And then the idea with hybrid applications is you essentially build your application once, and then you can deploy it uh, anywhere that you want to. So uh, React Native is uh, simply an extension of this hybrid model. Uh, what happens when you build a hybrid, applica hybrid application is uh, you're still building it out using HTML and CSS. So when you want to build a UI component, it's still built using HTML and CSS, and then you provide interactivity to it using JavaScript. Uh, you don't have access to native UI components that uh, Apple and Google provide to you in their uh, respective uh, operating systems. And um, if you want to get access to that, that's where React Native comes in. So React Native essentially provides you bindings to uh, the native layer, the actual native UI components. So when you build out a React Native application, you're still using JavaScript. Uh, you're still using uh, JSX to write out your templates. Uh, the only big difference now is that template actually renders out a native component and not HTML and CSS. So how does that happen? Uh, really what, what uh, happens when you bootstrap a React Native application is you start off with a uh, simple uh, native application, and that's the, the base layer. And within that native application, uh, the React Native library is actually uh, going, going to start up. And this, uh, this React Native library has bindings to uh, the native layer through Objective-C or Java code, depending on what platform you're running on. And then also, uh, this layer uh, is running its own uh, JavaScript engine. So there's actually an instance of the JavaScript core engine uh, executing, uh, running at this stage. And that's where your application is going to be executed. So, uh, and also, that's where the React.js, the, the web the web version of React is actually going to be bootstrapped. And what this allows us to do is use React components to build out the JavaScript application, which then spits out uh, native UI to us, but then the logic is still in JavaScript, and you get to write, or write out your application in JavaScript. In addition to all of this, um, uh, React Native also provides us with some uh, polyfills for web APIs. So uh, polyfills for things that we know and love to use on the, web, um, on the website, but now they're brought into native, so when you're doing native applications, you can apply the knowledge that you've learned in web development to native development. Uh, so we have polyfills for XHR requests and even the new uh, Fetch API uh, that's uh, part of the ES6 spec. Um, we have uh, polyfills for timers like window request animation frames, set timeout, and so on. And then you can even... Um, access uh, geolocation data through the Navigator API. And lastly, which is probably like the most important polyfill here, is CSS. So React Native actually polyfilled CSS for us so that we can do uh, layouts of native applications uh, using the Flexbox layout module. So we don't have the entire CSS spec available to us in React Native. It's a subset of, of the CSS spec. So you have things like uh, visual properties, like colors and fonts and borders and so on available to you. Uh, but when it comes to layout, you don't have the box module available to you. Uh, you only have uh, the Flexbox module available. So uh, to get started with React Native, uh, you need to in install a few different things. Uh, the first thing that you're going to need is Node. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have to install something called Watchman. And this is used for live reloading. And I'll show an example of uh, what that means. And then you can optionally install Flow, which if you're using Flow for type checking in your React app, uh, and then lastly, and most importantly, you need to install the React Native uh, CLI. And this is going to be uh, the tool that we use to bootstrap a new application and run the application whenever we want to build it. So to create a new project, uh, you simply call React Native in it and then the name of your uh, project. And this will then go and fetch all the dependencies and create a new directory with everything that you need for that project within it. <coughs> 
And then to run the application, you simply CD into that directory and run uh, React Native run iOS to run the iOS version of the app and React Native run Android to run the Android version of this app. So uh, before I go ahead, um, I just want to take a moment to talk about how React Native is uh, different from hybrid um, at a very fundamental level. With hybrid, we're building a hybrid application that looks, uh, well, you can style it differently on iOS and, or um, Android, uh, but really the idea is it's the same code base that's, that's deployed to both iOS and uh, Android. With React Native, um, although most we have a single code base and we're going to have a lot of shared logic between the two platforms, uh, we can still have the ability to target uh, components that uh, render differently on iOS uh, as opposed to Android. And the way we do that is by using uh, this uh, file extension. Uh, so if, if, a comp if a component has a file extension .ios.js, it's going to be picked up for the iOS version of the app. If it has a file extension .android.js, it's going to be picked up for the Android version of the app. And then to use that component, uh, if you import it out into uh, some other module, uh, React Native is smart enough to figure out what platform it's running on and pick up the appropriate version of it. Also, uh, I just want to get a show of hands. How many people here are familiar with uh, Flexbox? Okay, awesome. So it uh, seems like a lot of people. Uh, if you're new to Flexbox, essentially, it's a new kind of um, a layout module that's available to us in CSS. Uh, the way the, um, Previously, we had the box module. Now we have this thing called Flexbox. Uh, primarily, there are three properties with Flexbox. So you can lay out things uh, uh, based on direction of row or column. So row goes horizontally. Uh, column would go vertically. And uh, you can align this, uh, these uh, items using justify content. And justify content aligns things uh, along, the flow, uh, along the axis of flow. So in this case, everything is horizontal. So uh, justify content flex start keeps things on the left. Flex end will move them to the right. Uh, center will just simply center them. And then you have other options like space between and space around that lets, lets you space out things evenly. And then uh, there's a third property called align items that lets us align content along the cross axis. So in this case, it would be the y axis. So flex start is at top, flex end goes to the bottom, uh, center will just center the content. And uh, the most exciting thing is you have stretch now, to, so you can stretch to fill the parent container and not have to worry about uh, fiddling around with heights. So enough talk. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to jump over to the code uh, and walk through an application. Um, when you uh, bootstrap a new React Native app, uh, this is kind of what you get. You get a directory with um, an Android directory, an Android folder inside it, and that's going to be the Android application, the Java code that we need. Uh, the iOS version, iOS folder has an Xcode project with Objective C, uh, node module for any kind of dependencies that we need, and then we have the two JavaScript files, which are the entry into our application. So index.android.js and index.ios.js. And like I mentioned, uh, we can have different versions of the application running on different platforms. Uh, that's why we have the two uh, separate entry files. Um, but I'll show how to uh, not have to depend on having two sets of code there. And you can take away and uh, uh, take all the common code out and provide a, a single interface for both of them. So once we have that, uh, to run the application, uh, you simply go and load up your directory in, in your terminal and type in React Native uh, run iOS. And this will uh, start the development server uh, for React Native. And it will also uh, launch the iOS simulator with the actual app uh, running inside it. So I have the, the application running already, so I don't need to run this again. And uh, this is what we have in our application for now. So when you bootstrap this a new React Native application, this is, this is generally what you get. And if you look at the the both, both the iOS and the Android.js files, they look exactly the same. Uh, so I'm just going to go through the iOS version for now. And if you've ever worked with React before, this should look uh, extremely uh, familiar. So up top, we import React. And I just want to make sure everyone can read the code, or do you want me to make it bigger or smaller? Bigger? Is that better? Yeah. 
right. So uh, up top, we have, we're importing React and all the other components that we need to build out this application uh, from React Native. Uh, then we declare uh, a component, and this is exactly the same syntax that you use uh, for uh, the web version of React. Uh, the only difference is, uh, instead of using HTML here, or HTML like JSX here, uh, we're actually using components that are provided by React Native itself. Uh, so we're using something called view and something called text. Uh, view is equivalent to a div uh, in HTML, and text is equivalent to a paragraph tag or a span tag uh, uh, on native devices. And then, um, like I mentioned, we have uh, polyfills for CSS, so styles are created uh, as, uh, as JavaScript objects. So we do have polyfills for CSS, but we're not going to uh, write them out as a .css file. Uh, you write them out as JavaScript objects. So if you've ever done inline styles with React uh, or worked with something like Radium.js, uh, this should, again, look very familiar. Um, but uh, really, it's, it's a very uh, simple syntax where you have key value pairs where the key is a, a CSS property and then the value is whatever value that you want to set it to. Uh, so to, in order to create styles, you need to use the the style sheet, style sheet class that's uh, provided by React Native and call the dot create method and pass in the object that defines uh, the various styles. So here I've simply uh, created three sets of styles. So one for the container and that's the, the view container. So setting it to flex one makes it pick, take up uh, the entire screen vertically and everything is, uh, and, and the entire view expands to the parent. And then justify content center and align item center, and that's why the text is centered both vertically and horizontally. And then the different, uh, uh, different text uh, components are styled differently, just modifying the font size and margins, et cetera. And then right at the bottom uh, is the code that actually bootstraps the application. Um, when you use React, uh, React.js on the web, you use the React DOM utility and pass it a uh, the root node for your application, which then uh, renders it to uh, some DOM node that's available on your uh, HTML file. In React Native, we don't have the DOM. So instead, we rely on something called app registry. And again, this comes from the React Native library. And you call the register component method uh, on this. And the register component method accepts two arguments. Uh, the first one is the the name for your application, and this will be the name that you use when you bootstrap the new React application, a React Native application. And the second argument is a function uh, which returns the root node for your, for your application. So in our case, um, it's called Spotify Artist Lookup, so the component we defined up there is passed into it. So uh, this is a native device, uh, the iOS emulator that's running our application. So before I go forward, I, I wanna show some uh, really cool debugging features that are available to us in React Native. So to bring up the developer menu, uh, you can either uh, toggle the shake gesture uh, on your device or simply hit uh, Command-D on, uh, on the keyboard and that brings up the developer menu for us. And this enables us to do a few different things. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is enable live reload. So now, uh, every time I make any changes to my file and hit save, it refreshes the application with the latest version. So you don't have to worry about compiling and then waiting for that to finish compiling and then loading up your application again. Uh, you get the same experience you get uh, on the web. The second thing uh, I'm going to do is enable debugging in Chrome. Uh, and what this does is allows us to go to uh, localhost 8081 slash debugger UI and now uh, we have access to uh, all the debug tools that are available to us in Chrome. Uh, so if I put any console.log statements, they will be uh, visible on the console. Uh, if I put in a debugger statement, uh, you'll notice that uh, Chrome actually pauses at that, at that line and then you can look at the local uh, variables and the global variables and debug your application. Um, I can also put in uh, console.warn statements. And uh, this is a pretty cool feature uh, because anything that you put in console.warn, uh, not only do you get it in the Chrome console, but it also pops up as a little yellow box down here in your React application. Uh, and you'll see these popping up from time to time when you're trying to do something that's against React best practices and uh, React will try to guide you to do things the right way. Uh, 
And lastly, if I uh, use a console.error statement, uh, you'll see the red screen that you might have noticed, uh, you might have experienced on uh, the web version of React 2, and the same way uh, as on the web, if I click on one of these files, it actually opens it up in my text editor and takes you to the line where the error originated. Okay, so uh, for the rest of this uh, talk, uh, what I'm going to do is showcase the different APIs that are available, available to us in React uh, by walking through a fairly basic application. So I'm just going to switch to the end result and then uh, go back to beginning and then uh, build it out slowly. So this is the final version of the application. It's really basic. The idea is um, it's using the Spotify search API. There's a input box, and if I search for an artist name here, it's going to return a bunch of artists back to us. Uh, and we render them out in a list uh, with the image on the left, the name on the right. And then if I click on uh, one of the artist names, it uh, takes us to a web view that's running. So this is actually So this is actually a uh, web view that's, ru that's running. Um, and um, it's not, so this, the, the UI you see here is not actually React Native, it's just simply loading up a Spotify.com page uh, within a uh, instance of Safari, uh, but all of that is within our React Native app. And then we have uh, simple routing so that we can go back and go back to our main page. So uh, I'm going to start from the beginning. So this is the very first thing uh, that we need to do to build out this application. Uh, all we have at this point is a text input uh, where we can uh, type in some content, uh, but nothing's happening. There is no interactivity, and there's nothing else being rendered on the page. So let's look at our application now. So these are our index files for both iOS and Android, and they're exactly the same as uh, before, except the actual definition of the co component uh, has been moved out of here. Um, and all you have is the bootstrapping logic. So in order to make as much of the code as we can uh, unified between the two platforms, I'm simply moving out that definition to um, a root component. So let's go look at uh, what's in the root component. And similar to before, uh, we import React and all the components that we need. Um, I also have this utility file for colors. And all it is is simply a uh, object that allows me to uh, set some color value values globally so I can use them in my styles, so like CSS variables. Um, and then I act have the actual definition of the root component. And now, uh, in this root component, uh, we still have a view wrapper. Um, and instead of just text components, we have uh, two components here. The first one is a status bar, and the second one is a text input. So the text input one is fairly obvious. It simply provides us with an input box. Uh, the status bar one, uh, on the other hand, is uh, slightly special. So right now, it's set to light content. So what that means is it allows you to control the uh, the look of, this, of the status bar um, on iOS and Android. So uh, right now, because of light content, it's just, it's just white text on a white background, so you don't actually see it. Uh, but if I change this to default, you'll see it actually changes to black color. So that's pretty awesome that you can do that right away. And then we still have our styles as before. Uh, and uh, really, uh, it's just the starting point uh, for our application. So the next thing I want to do is bring in the list component and actually start rendering out uh, some, of the, uh, some of the UI. So I'm going to jump into the next uh, branch here. So at this point now, we still have uh, the input element, uh, but now we also have this list uh, that's rendering out uh, some data. Um, it's just uh, 
a text uh, input, in, uh, sorry, a text component inside it. We don't have the image yet, uh, but I want to show how we build out this list component first. Um, another thing that I've done at this point is starting to break down the application. So instead of having uh, the entire view in our, our root component, uh, we now have a new component called main, which is going to be our main page. And then uh, in a sh short time, we'll also have another component called artist, which is going to have the web view part uh, that we navigate to. So I uh, will jump into the main component now. And uh, primarily, it looks the same thing as before. The big difference is, uh, along with the status bar and the text input, uh, we now have something called list view. And list view is a component that is provided by React Native. And uh, this is actually an extremely powerful uh, component. Uh, when you're building hybrid applications, uh, the first place where you run into issues is building out uh, massive lists with like thousands of uh, lines of uh, data or thousands of items of data, um, or you're trying to build out some kind of infinite scroll. And uh, trying to get that to work in a performance performant way uh, tends to be really challenging. Uh, with list view, you get that out of the box. You don't need to worry about uh, how am I going to render uh, 10,000 lines of uh, items and somehow still get uh, really good scroll performance. Uh, list view just does that for, for you. And because it has all of that uh, performance built into it, uh, usage of the list view is slightly different to how you would do, uh, how you would actually render out multiple items in React. So. Um, on the web, you might be used to creating an array and then mapping over, over that array and returning um, a bunch of different items from that array to render out the components. Uh, under the hood, that's basically what's happening, uh, but we need to tell list view uh, what to render. And the first thing that we need to pass into it is uh, something called data source. And this data source is a special uh, object that's available to us from React Native, um, and it's available through uh, list view, uh, dot data source. So to initiate a new data source, you simply call new, dot, uh, new list view dot data source, and then you pass in an object, which is the configuration uh, for your data source. And uh, primarily, you just need one property to uh, to pass in, and that's row has changed. So this list view has a has a concept of two dimensional data. You can have uh, only a single section with multiple rows, or you can have multiple sections with each section having its own row. And the row has changed function is going to be used to figure out uh, when you, whenever you update this data source whether the new values that are coming in are in fact different from the old value, and based on that, uh, if they are, you're actually going to update uh, what's being rendered on the page. So in this case, I'm simply uh, comparing the previous value to the new value, and if they're different, uh, then React Native is going to do a re-render. And then to update the values for this data source, uh, so the data source is assigned to a variable called ds. So I can simply call uh, ds.clone with rows. And clone with rows is a method that allows us to update the data source by simply passing in uh, the new list uh, that we want to apply. So, in the, so we started off with an empty list, and then I pass in this array, and now the, the, the list is actually going to be set to this value. And then finally, I'm also uh, creating some internal state on this component, and then simply st uh, storing that data source on our state object. And the reason I'm doing that is so that we can then uh, grab it in our render block and actually render out uh, the list items. And the way we render out those list items is uh, through this last property called uh, render row. So render row uh, expects a callback which will be fired um, every single time uh, it iterates through uh, the list of your data. And this render row is passed um, in three arguments. The first one is the actual data item. Uh, the second one is the section ID. And the third one is the row ID. And in this case, I'm simply returning a text component. Um, and the value inside that text component is the actual ID of the row. Um, and a, a plus whatever data that's provided to us in the row. So you'll notice here it renders out uh, numbers uh, followed by whatever strings that we actually uh, passed into our data source. So uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is actually uh, modify this to build out the media object, where we have the image on the left um, and then some text on the right and add some interactivity to it. <coughs> 
So uh, once again, I'm going to uh, jump into the next branch. And now you'll notice that we actually have uh, a list generated. It's still the same data as previously. Uh, the only difference is instead of using, using uh, the index on the left, I'm actually rendering out an image. Um, and another thing I've done is uh, the render row function was starting to be a bit too big. So instead of just putting it there in line, I actually assigned it to a method on our component. Uh, so we have this render row method attached to our main component now. And then uh, similar to previously, we still get the, the row data passed in. So now it's just simply some kind of text that's being passed in, the section ID, and then finally the row ID. The big difference now is instead of uh, returning a text component, uh, now we're actually returning a list item component. So uh, this list item component isn't something that's built into React Native. It's just simply a new component uh, that I've created here. So let's go into list item component and see what's going on there. Uh, similar to uh, before, we define a new React com uh, component. Uh, the only difference here is instead of using the uh, class syntax to extend the component class, I'm actually building out a stateless component. So we can just simply use uh, the arrow function syntax, but it still behaves the same way. Uh, and the only thing here is you can't attach any internal methods here. So whatever you return from here, that is the template for your component. And uh, looking at the render block, you'll notice uh, really we just have a view component uh, that has an image component inside it and a text component. And then uh, this view component is wrapped in something called uh, touchable opacity. So uh, with React Native, we actually have uh, direct access to uh, the underlying uh, touch, and, uh, the touch API on native devices. So that allows us to uh, do a lot of uh, nice complex things like build out uh, custom gestures or uh, use React's built-in uh, built uh, gesture handling library. Uh, but also, that al uh, what that means is we have to go and tell things specifically that uh, something in, our, in my app can actually be touched. So you can actually tap it. And then whenever you tap it, we can attach some kind of uh, on-tap function. And, and the way you do that is by wrapping things in uh, uh, this uh, touchable component. And there are different kinds of touchable components available to us. Uh, there's a simple touchable component that simply uh, allows you to attach a callback. Uh, there's touchable opacity, which uh, whenever you touch a component now, it actually uh, reduces the opacity of that component. And you can control uh, how much that opacity goes down by and so on. Uh, there's also things like uh, touchable highlight, which will then highlight the component by uh, putting a overlay uh, rectangle on that component. Uh, and then finally, there's a touchable native feedback that lets you uh, bind into uh, some other kinds of native feedbacks that are available, things like vibration and so on. So uh, that part's straightly, uh, pretty forward, uh, straightforward. Um, image loading, however, tends to be uh, a bit confusing when you first get started with React Native. And the reason for that is, uh, well, first thing you'll notice is this image component, instead of taking in a, a SRC property, uh, it actually uses something, uh, the source property. And there's very good reason for that. Uh, the reason is when we use image, uh, image components on a, uh, in HTML, uh, the source attribute simply uh, expects a string, which is going to be the URL where, it, uh, where then the browser can fetch the image from. In React Native, uh, the image component can accept both a uh, URL, but also a uh, raw image data. So you can actually load up an image from the file system, get the bytecode, and pass that bytecode into your image component, and expect it to render out uh, just like a URL would. So you can load up images in two different ways. Uh, the first way is uh, you can require an image uh, from your file system. So here I have this placeholder image that shows up on the left. Uh, so in order to lo uh, load up that uh, file, all you have to do is call require and then uh, the path to that image. And this is simply going to load up the file, uh, decode it, and return the, the raw data to you and assign it to the placeholder variable. Um, on the other hand, if you have a URL, uh, you have to pass in an object into the source property. And this is what the object looks like. Uh, it just has one property uh, called URI. 
and then you can provide an image URL to it. Uh, you can also set height and width here uh, if you want to, but in our case, because we're loading an image from a URL, uh, we're applying the, those things through the style uh, property instead. So in this case, our list item component um, expects uh, two properties to be passed in. Uh, the first one is text, uh, which is going to be the text on the right-hand side that's rendered out. Uh, the second one is an image URL. So all we're doing at this point is checking to see uh, was an image URL passed in? If not, then use the placeholder image. If, if, if it was passed in, then actually render out that image itself. Okay. So uh, for now, all the data that we've been using was hard-coded in our uh, main uh, component. And if I go back into here, into the main component, I changed the, the state, ob uh, state object. So previously, we were simply calling it data source. So now I'm actually going to call it artist, because that's what we actually are going to be fetching from the API. So the next step, uh, we're going to remove this hard-coded data and instead uh, set up our API endpoint and actually pull in the data uh, from the Spotify API. So uh, we switch to that next branch now, and um, the list has gone away. And the reason for that is now we actually have the API wired up. So if I search for an artist, we actually get the, the list of artists coming back from the Spotify API. Uh, and the way we do this is uh, the first thing I need to do is create a utility file. Uh, so I made one called uh, fetcher.js. And this is where we define our API uh, endpoints. So instead of using XHR, um, I'm going to be using the ES6 fetch API. And uh, under the hood, it's basically the same thing. You're still making HTTP requests. The big difference is it's a much more simplified API. If you've used uh, Angular in the past, it works something similar to the $HTTP service. Or, or if you used uh, AJAX uh, through jQuery, again, it's a similar interface where you can just simply call the fetch. And this is a new keyword that's available to you uh, in ES6 and in React Native, we can actually just use ES6. Uh, we don't have to worry about um, transpiling or anything. The React Native uh, uh, CLI actually does that for us. And then uh, we can pass in a URL that we actually want to fetch. Uh, by default, this is going to make a GET request. If you want to make a POST request, uh, PUT request, or a DELETE re request, uh, you can pass in a second argument where you can define what kind of request you want to make. And the other nice thing about this API is uh, it returns promises to you. So you don't have to worry about callbacks. You can simply make the request, uh, attach dot then blocks to it, um, and wait for the request to resolve, and then continue uh, running your application. So here I attach a dot then block that will receive the response that is coming back uh, from the server, uh, and then call uh, response dot uh, JSON method. And this is, again, part of the API spec. Uh, that will convert the, the data that's coming back into a JavaScript object and then pass it on to the next den, den block. Uh, the second function I have in here is uh, search for. And this is where we actually construct the API uh, URL that we want to hit. So this is the Spotify uh, search API URL. We pass in one query into this URL. So I'm using the ES6 template syntax. And that allows us to uh, use variables inside a string. So whatever query you pass in, that will be uh, concatenated into this string. And then we simply call the get method defined up here to make the request. Uh, when the request is resolved, uh, we will get the, the JavaScript data back from the request. And if it's uh, the right kind of request, we actually it was actually successful, uh, then we'll have an artist's property on the object coming back. Uh, so we will actually return the items uh, that's attached to that uh, artist property. Um, if we get an empty request back or something failed, uh, we simply return an empty array instead. So where we call this is in our main component. So in our main component, uh, now we have, we still have a data source. We created uh, a new list view data source. Uh, but the big difference is we did not set any value to it by default. And if we look at the text input component now, I have a new property on it now called onChangeText. And this allows you to provide a callback that will be fired uh, every single time you type into this input box. And I'm, uh, I define the method called makeQuery on this component class. 
uh, where we're actually defining the callback handler. Um, and make query simply uh, calls the search for method that we defined in our fetcher.js file, passes in the text value from the input box, um, and then makes a request to fetch a bunch of artists. And when that data comes back, uh, when I update the state, I'm not simply going to uh, replace artists with a new artist coming in. And the reason for that is, remember up here when we initialize this component, uh, artist is actually a list view data source. So in order to update that, I need to get the existing value of that data source and then use the clone with rows method and pass in the new array that's coming in and update the, uh, the state. So whenever the response resolves, uh, we update the state and it renders out uh, the list of artists in our view. Um, and then finally, I'm, I'm wrapping this call in a debounce. So that's just simply a utility that I pulled in from Lodash uh, to provide a 400 millisecond debounce so that I'm not hitting the API too many times and can uh, reduce the number of requests that we're making. And the end result of all of that is I can type in an artist's name, get the result back, and then render it out uh, as a list. And you'll notice that if you actually have an image for the artist, it renders out. If, it, if we don't have an image, then we just use the placeholder image that we defined earlier. Cool. And uh, we still have the touchable opacity attached to it. So we, we can touch things, and uh, the opacity decreases. But we don't have any click handlers attached to it yet. And I'll get to that shortly. So the next step is uh, bringing in some animations. And that's my favorite part of React Native. So now you'll notice uh, when I make that request, we get the list back. Uh, but it also, uh, each item fades in from a, a zero opacity to one. I'll just demo that once more. And uh, the way we do this is uh, by using uh, something called Animated, uh, which is an API that React Native provides to us. And that's just uh, probably uh, the most exciting thing about React Native, because um, you get to use the full power of a native device to build out really complex animations. Um, and because this is React, uh, you can build out those, uh, those animations in a very composable manner. Uh, you have the ability to do sequencing, uh, staggering, um, or delaying animations. Um, and then finally, you can actually use uh, native gestures. So every time I scroll on this page, you can use that native gesture to drive an animation. So it's essentially like creating a timeline, but instead of using time to drive that animation, you use the value of the scroll gesture to drive that animation. Uh, or if you're swiping, so the Tinder swipe card, uh, it's, it's really easy to build with uh, React Native because you have that swipe gesture built in, and you can use that to drive any kind of animation that you want to. And uh, the place that I'm doing that is, so this is, again, our list item component, so the component that renders out uh, the image and then the text. And previously, we had it wrapped in a touchable opacity component. And now I also wrap, in, I wrap it in a new component uh, called uh, fade in view. So again, this is a custom component that I built out that allows us to define the, the fade in animation. And then anything that uh, is wrapped with this fade in, uh, fade in component will be animated with that opacity going from 0 to 1. So let's look at this fade in, comp fade in view component and see what's going on there. So again, uh, the same syntax. You import React. You define a new component. And in this case, we're actually using the class syntax to define the, the new component. And the reason for that is we need to have internal state for this component. Uh, so we need to use, the, use a stateful component. And then in the constructor, I uh, set this, uh, the state object um, on, initi on initialization. Uh, and then this is where we uh, initialize our animation. So I'm using the animated class that's provided through React Native. Um, and I simply, I'm simply animating a value from 0 to 1. Uh, you're not actually animating opacity at this stage. All you're doing is animating an, a value from 0 to 1. Uh, so I call animated.value and pass in uh, the initial value for this animation. Then in the component did mount uh, uh, lifecycle method, when the, the what, whatever is actually using this animation, whenever that uh, component actually is mounted, uh, that's where we're going to essentially play this animation. So you created this animation, 
and then we define uh, the type of easing that we want to do, the type of tweening that we want to do for this animation. So you call animated.timing to initialize a new timing function. Uh, this expects two arguments. The first one is the actual animation that you want to uh, run from an initial value to, to the final value. And then the second, one, second argument is an object which defines the final state of this animation. So in this case, I'm setting the two value to one. Uh, any kind of delay that is being passed into this component will be applied as a delay. And then finally, a duration to uh, tell us uh, what is the duration for this animation. And then when we call the dot start method on it, it's actually going to play the animation and run it. So what you'll notice here is when I make the request, the animation plays the first time. When I uh, continue making another request, um, these two list items were already uh, rendered out. So this animation only executes once when the component is mounted. So these, uh, these two uh, list items, because they were part of uh, the view already, uh, the animation is not going to trigger again. But you can use other lifecycle hooks and trigger it uh, multiple times if you want to. And then finally, in our render block, uh, we use the animated uh, dot view component to decide uh, what property is it that we'd actually want to animate. So you notice this style attribute here. Uh, this style attribute is actually where all the work happens. Uh, we use, uh, uh, this is where we're actually animating opacity. So I set uh, the key to op opacity. And the value is simply the animation that we defined uh, up top here. So what this is going to do is, as the animation is executing, um, it's going to pl play the value from 0 to 1 based on whatever timing function that you're using, and simply update that value, that, that style value. And then uh, whatever component this fade in view component is wrapping, the same style value is going to be applied to that child component. And the way that happens is using this uh, uh, children props. So in React, um, on the JS side, on, on the website, and both on native, uh, there is always a property called children. And uh, whatever components that you put inside uh, the actual usage of your component class is going to be passed in as children. So we simply take the components, this view component from here, and when we render out our fade in view, they're going to be placed inside this animated view component. So we apply uh, the animation class here. Um, if I actually wanted to animate uh, uh, let's say the position. So uh, in, instead of uh, doing opacity, if I wanted to animate uh, margin, uh, what I will do is start with, let's say, minus 56 or something. Uh, the final value is going to be 0. And then instead of opacity, all I have to do is change this to uh, margin left. And now when I uh, make a request, you see that little wave animation of things moving in. So it's a really powerful API and lets you do uh, so many different things. Uh, this is just a, a very basic introduction to it. Um, uh, I would recommend going and checking out uh, the documentation to see uh, some of the other really cool stuff that you can do. And then uh, the final stage uh, of this application is to hook up the router. So for that, I'm just simply going to go back to the master branch. And you'll notice now we actually have our navigation bar up top. And uh, when I s make a search now and hit on an artist name, it navigates to a new view. So in order to do this, uh, if we go back to our uh, root component, so far the root component was simply uh, rendering out our main view. Uh, now, however, because we have uh, routing hook up, hooked up, uh, we actually need to uh, render out something called a navigator component. And this is the built-in uh, navigation component for React Native. Uh, there's also another one called Navigator iOS, which is not maintained by uh, the core React Native team. Uh, and it's only specific to iOS, so it uh, gives you certain iOS-specific hooks. But uh, if you use the Navigator component, then y the same component can be rendered out on both um, iOS and Android, um, and you don't have to worry about maintaining two versions of your application. So uh, this navigator component, by default, is simply going to set up routing. Um, and it expects a few different properties. Uh, the first one is initial route. Uh, 
So uh, navigation in React um, actually is uh, stack-based navigation. And what that means is the entire history of what the user is doing, uh, the different routes that uh, the user has navigated to, is maintained as an array. And then you can simply push new states or push new routes into this array to go to the next state. Uh, or you can uh, call pop to go back to the previous state. So here, when I define this initial uh, route object, uh, that is the state uh, that we want to load up for the first time. And what goes in here is totally up to you. So in my case, I'm going to have two properties. The first one is ID. So this is going to be the ID of the route that I want to go to. And the second one is the title. And that title is what I'm going to be rendering up here in the navigation bar. And then finally, uh, we have the render scene method, uh, which is used to uh, render out uh, our application, uh, our ac uh, figure out the, uh, the logic for this router. Uh, and that's the one defined up here. So you check to see what the route ID is. If it's main, it's going to render out the main comp component. And if it's, uh, if it's um, some other uh, ID, then we render out the artist component. And I'm um, sorry, I'm running short on time, so I'm just going to quickly show what the artist component looks like. Uh, it's simply a view component, and we're using a web view component inside it, uh, which renders out, uh, which is basically what you do in a hybrid application. So you could technically load a hybrid application in here. In my case, I'm simply loading up whatever URL the Spotify API returns to us. Uh, and then when we navigate to that, that's what we see here. So this is actually a web page. And then uh, the navigation bar is a built-in component into React Native that uh, renders out the navigation bar up top. Uh, we can provide logic for uh, the previous button that you see on the left, the next button on the right, and then the title in the middle. So uh, that's basically it uh, to build out this application. Um, I actually have the code up on GitHub. Uh, so you can go to github.com slash Winker versus Bex slash Spotify Artist Lookup. I'll tweet out a link later, and of course, it's part of the slides that will be made available to you. Uh, but yeah, that's everything that I have for you. Uh, thank you very much.